All right. So our focus today is the Middle East and North Africa. For me, what is exciting or frightening about the region today is I can almost see world history turning on its axis through this region. I'll fill you in on what I mean by that. I don't just mean politics of the last 20 years. I really mean the politics uh, of the last several hundred years. Now, this region, as Justin said, is core to the Abrahamic religions. Uh, Europe was kind of on the passive receiving end of the events in the Middle East. Christianity spread from the Middle East into Europe. Uh, Islam spread across North Africa into Spain. And it was really only in the 15th and 16th centuries that Europe started to push back against the wave of political and economic influence from the East. Indeed, the Mediterranean economy was largely dominated by uh, Italians who had to go through the Ottoman Empire in order to obtain goods coming from uh, India, China, and the Middle East. So this entire region was crucial for Europe in terms of the flow of ideas, luxury goods, and so on into the European continent. Now, when Europe started to exert itself as an international power, it did so by extending its influence through this region and to the east. So the Portuguese moved around Africa, the British followed, but the European powers also went through this region. Britain developed a port at Aden. The Europeans developed fortresses along the coast of India. Then they pushed further into China, into Macau and Hong Kong. So as Europe expanded its international trade in the age of expansion and discovery, it did so by developing a string of overseas settlements and forts through which it gradually extended and developed its power and influence in Asia. And indeed, at the end of World War I, when the core, the green region here, and the Maghreb, the Ottoman Empire collapsed after World War I. European powers actually carved up much of that territory and took it over in various protectorates um, and colonial regions. Um, so the relationship between Europe and the Middle East uh, has been longstanding, but for the last couple hundred years, most of the influence has been Europe imposing its vision and plans on the Middle East in order to facilitate the growth of Europe's economy. As I said earlier, it was the growth of Europe's economy to take advantage of trade with India and China. Then as oil became important, oil became a major resource for Europe. Um, recently, what is interesting to me is the degree to which this flow from west to east of European influence um, domination has been in the process of being reversed. Now, Throughout the um, last couple decades, uh, the U.S. has struggled with what to do with this region. Um, Iran, a key player in this area, has no natural allies in this region. Um, it is surrounded by uh, Russia to the north, Central Asia to the north, and Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, all major Sunni powers to the west. Um, Iran did historically have strong links to Afghanistan, but Pakistan is another major Sunni power. And so the Shia Iranian state has always kind of struggled to solidify its security. It did so in the 50s, 60s, and 70s through an alliance with the United States. The US was the Shah's biggest backer. We know how that turned out. The result has been decades of enmity between Iran and the United States, which has spilled over to relations with Europe. And so Iran has had to be on its own, but in recent years has turned increasingly to China for trade. And the story of turn to China 
is the one that I want to bring up today for the Middle East. It's not the one we normally hear about. What we normally hear about are what will the relationships between Russia, Europe, and the U.S. be with regard to Iran? What will be the conflicts between Saudi Arabia and Iran? What will be the role with regard to Egypt? But we have experts on all of these areas today, and I'm anxious to hear from them. I'm not a specialist in the Middle East per se. My specializations are in global history and global politics. And from that perspective, it has been striking in just the last few years to see United States influence throughout the Middle East diminish and that of Russia and China start to grow. The conflict in Syria obviously has been a major uh, factor in the decline of the United States influence. Uh, Barack Obama tried to enforce what he said was a red line on Syria's use of chemical weapons. He found he could not get the domestic support he needed to do that, and therefore had to work with Russia in order to get that done. Russia, meanwhile, showed that it was far more willing to exert itself in support of its ally, uh, the authoritarian regime in Syria, uh, led by Bashar al-Assad, um, than the United States was willing to back the opposition. After all, the opposition was deeply fragmented, difficult to work with, and contained some fairly uh, extremist uh, jihadist groups, and the United States therefore never quite found its way to figuring out how it could build an effective opposition, who it would work with, and who it would support. The U.S. therefore kind of left things open for Russia to exert itself ever more strongly. Similar, similar story is true for Iran. Iran intervened in the war in Syria. The United States did not push back against that intervention. And so Iran and Russia together have taken a much stronger role. The United States had, of course, a huge, painful intervention in Iraq that lasted over a decade. But the United States, again, tried to backpedal and withdraw from Iraq as far as it could, again, under President Obama and continuing under President Trump. Part of the reason for this is understandable. The United States had seen the Middle East primarily in terms of its economic resources, oil being a critical factor for modern economies. But in the last few years, oil has become less important. Economies have continued to grow despite burning fewer fossil fuels. And the United States has become, through the benefits of fracking, a huge producer of um, fossil fuels on its own, and indeed is able to meet its domestic demand and is likely to become a considerable exporter of natural gas or oil in the future. So from the point of the United States, narrow short-term interests, it's not worth spilling a lot of blood for the Middle East. Its oil is not as important to us. Other countries, Iran and Russia, seem much more deeply invested in shaping events. And so the U.S. seems to be okay with taking a step backward. In a sense, though, I feel this is terribly short-sighted globally, because what is happening is this crucial region, which stands kind of at the pathway to Europe, the crucial bridge between Europe and Asia, is now very likely to be shifting from a kind of Western sphere of influence to a more Eurasian sphere of influence, and especially finding itself playing a different role, this time in China's vision of the future world. And my time is limited, so I'm going to be brief on this. China felt particularly badly treated by the West as the result of European expansion. In the course of the Opium Wars, the Taiping Rebellion, the Boxer Rebellion, war with Japan, uh, war, uh, civil war, uh, within China during World War II, China was repeatedly invaded, dominated, and robbed of its resources by foreign powers. The Chinese refer to this as a century of humiliation. China is now actively seeking to reverse that. And although the United States vision of the world was that as the Middle East emerged from its colonial sphere, Gradually, the nations of that region would become more open, more democratic, part of a broader Western alliance. That does not seem to be happening. Obviously, there were disappointments there, the uprisings of the Arab Spring. Some people hailed as the opening of a new democratic chapter in the region. 
but that appears not to be working well, except perhaps in Tunisia. And indeed, not only have the countries of the Arab uprisings rolled back in a more authoritarian direction, Turkey, which was, has been a key ally of the United States since the Cold War and was seen to be a bastion of Western influence, is becoming more authoritarian uh, under President Erdogan and is turning away from what had been a closer alliance with the West. Yes, there are still limited areas of cooperation, but Turkey threatens recently an Ottoman slap at the United States should it start to disagree too strongly with Turkey's policies. China, as I said, felt the most put upon by European expansion and is therefore actively working to roll that back, not just by expanding its influence in the South China Sea, which we often hear about. That's really just kind of one small step in China's international plan. China actually has been investing all throughout this region. Many people were surprised that when an uprising broke out against Gaddafi and Libya was consumed by civil war, one of the main news stories was about the evacuation of thousands of Chinese workers. The Chinese have built their first uh, military base here at Djibouti, at the mouth uh, of the Red Sea. They have purchased the Greek port of Piraeus and are building a rail line through Serbia. They're working on rail and sea connections that are designed to create a direct route from China to Europe through the Indian Ocean. Uh, you can't see Sri Lanka on the map here, but the Chinese uh, recently built a huge deep water port uh, in Sri Lanka that they've since taken uh, ownership of. They're working on building a railway through Pakistan to give them direct access to the Indian Ocean. They are investing throughout the Middle East and Africa. And the goal of all of this Chinese effort is, in a sense, to turn world history 180 degrees and duplicate to Europe precisely what Europe did to China. That is, Europe built a string of bases and fortifications to project its economic goods and its power into East Asia. China is now working on building a string of ports, fortifications, and railways to deliver Chinese goods and Chinese political influence throughout Central Asia, through the Middle East, and into Europe. What's happening in the Middle East is quite striking in terms of that plan. The United States and Europe had looked at the regimes in the Middle East as authoritarian but still valuable allies to the extent they were first anti-Soviet or anti-communist and second, more recently, opposed to radical Islamist movements. The United States was willing to say, until those adversaries are defeated, we can tolerate authoritarian regimes, but we hope that once those uh, major threats fade, we'll see a positive uh, reformist Western-leaning change in these countries. And in fact, the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003 was motivated by the idea that if Iraq could be rid of its dictatorship, and somehow turned into a prosperous democracy. That would be a model that would influence Iran, would create a core of Western influence, would encourage positive trends in Turkey, and create a kind of bastion of Western and uh, democratic influence in that region. Obviously, the uh, plan was ill-conceived in many ways, and although Iraq is, uh, institutionally more democratic now than it was um, under the previous regime, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, it is still far from being a proper uh, democracy. And most of the other regimes in this area uh, obviously are far from it. We'll hear more from our experts, but Egypt has become arguably more repressive than it was even under Hosni Mubarak, although the United States has embraced the Sisi regime. Uh, Turkey, as I've mentioned, uh, under President Erdogan, is becoming more and more personalist, authoritarian in nature. The significance of all of this is that if the Middle East does tilt in the direction of being more open to influence from Eurasia, Russia, Iran, and China, and becomes more 
anti-Western, less democratic, liberal in its outlook, instead of being a kind of bastion and extension of Europe that would resist the expansion of Chinese influence, the reverse occurs. Instead, the Middle East becomes much more a group of nations falling into the pattern of state-directed authoritarian development that matches closely with that of China. And to the extent that this area becomes more and more solidified in an authoritarian pattern and becomes more and more hostile to Western US and European influence, that historical trend since the 1500s of the expansion of European ideas, economic institutions, and political institutions gets pushed further and further back. And indeed, Europe becomes in the defensive situation that China faced centuries ago. I'll close just by noting my worries that Egypt, uh, far from moving in a direction that seems positive, seems to be under tighter military control uh, than at any time in the past several decades. And the United States is making no complaint and no effort to change that. Turkey has embarked on one of the harshest, most violent campaigns against journalists, as well as buying up uh, all major free media and putting it under control of either the state or close friends of the state. Again, no objections from the West. Uh, instead, uh, Erdogan is being valued for use of an airfield and for his uh, bottling up of refugees from the Middle East. And so the US and Europe say, well, we'll tolerate this behavior. Uh, this pattern of tolerating repressive behavior in the hope of someday achieving a better outcome uh, was disastrous in Iran, was disastrous in Iraq. And I see no reason to expect that in the long term it will be better. So my concerns in terms of what next are not just there. We've had a bad few years. The uh, Arab uprising was rough, but sure, certainly things will get better in the future. I'm not so sure. I'm worried that the entire trend of global history, when you step back and look at it in perspective, is one in which the f advance of Enlightenment ideals, European institutions, European dominance of the Eurasian economic zone are all in the process of being reversed. And as that process occurs, Chinese influence grows all across Eurasia. The model of democratic, liberal government and open free markets diminishes. And Europe and America will be thrown more on an isolated and defensive stance. I hope it doesn't work that way. But those are the trends I see in the region that I find most alarming.